Welcome to Home and Away on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nathan Grubel. In case this is the first time you're listening to one of these episodes, what we like to do on this particular episode of the feed is we like to have one of us host, and then this is really our space to bring in a guest outside of the No Ceilings NBA team, get to know somebody else in the basketball space. And I am thrilled and honored to be joined by, I don't think I could have a better guest on for, for my turn to be host at Home and Away. I got Coach Dave Leto with me from the Overtime Elite City Reapers. He is the head coach of, as you would know in the draft community, if you're listening to this podcast, Amanda Nassar Thompson. Coach, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm wonderful, Nathan. And uh, how much money you want you want for them statements there about me? I, 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 got a little bit. I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot. No. Could, could, come I'm on, Coach. I, I, I do have some good things to say about you in, in this podcast, but it's because you're you're quite the man in, in the space. You've been a head coach all across college basketball. You've been a G League head coach. so And now you found yourself with the Overtime Elite program. So I'm really curious to pick your brain, kind of get to know you and what you like to instill in your teams and your players. And then we, we will get to the Thompson Twins a little bit in this podcast. That's what a lot of people want to know. But that's that's not where I wanted to start the podcast. So like I said, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit. So you do have a rich history in the game. You were recruited by, played for, and coached under one of the greatest college coaches the game has ever seen in Jim Calhoun. You've obviously taken two other high major programs to the NCAA tournament, DePaul and Virginia. I just want to ask you to start, what were some of the lessons that you were able to learn or take away from Coach Calhoun that's really helped you in, in your coaching journey and your, your mentorship journey? Yeah, it's, it's really, Nathan, a really, really good question. I've been asked a number of times, you know, more not from my vantage point, but from Coach Calhoun, so what made him who who he is and was as a coach and a, as a human being. And so my answer has been refined to be really simplistic. You know, there are X and O guys that are great with defensively as we were offensively. And at one point we specialized in point guards and it was wings and big guys and and we ran a 2-2-1, best of anybody. We led the country in steals. We led the country in scoring. So he was a chameleon as far as that goes. But the foundation of it all was competitiveness. And I think more than anything that I've learned being around him in the majority of my coaching career is the competitive spirit. So the example I give is I don't know that I've ever met a coach at any level, any male, female, that, that doesn't want their team to win and doesn't want the team to play hard. Okay, so when you say play hard, fellas, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And there are those programs in Connecticut had been one for many, many years under him. And this is this is, you know, part of my explanation is that there's another level to that. Uh, It's it's something that has to be ingrained in you uh, It's passionate about how you look at the game of basketball, how you look at life. uh, And it just so happens to to be delivered on the court every day in practice and especially in games. And so to me, amongst all the things that he was really good at from an X and O standpoint, that became our separator. And in joining the overtime elite program, right? This is, this is one of the the better foundations that's here in this country for really prioritizing the development of youth basketball players, right? High school age players all the way up through when they can prepare for the NBA draft. How exciting is it to bring those lessons, bring that type of culture into a program like this that is really having, in my humble opinion, you know, really great success in attracting top talent, learning how to become professionals? Yeah, it, it's a really unique idea that has been, you know, underway for a little over a year and a half. And I think as it's been rolled out to the basketball community and those who are in- interested, it's, it's it, at first it was a strange concept because nothing in this country has ever been done before. Uh, and people like to travel down a certain path and not you know, deviate from that path at all. So there was some apprehension initially, uh, but once they understood the dynamics and especially those who have come here and seen it for their for their uh, for themselves, out of their own eyes, they're like, now I know exactly what you're talking about. So it's the highest level in a lot of things that we do. Skill development, you know, primarily of getting these guys better. We have you know, some of the best skill development coaches and coaches that, that you can bring into one building every day. Um, our academic department, our social media content, our health and performance, analytics, you know, sports psychology, money management, all those things were carefully put together so that we can give these young men the best opportunity to do well. 
for, for my part and, and Kevin Ali's part, you know, we've always been about human development as much as skill development. So we get a chance to pour into them without a whole lot of, uh, I use the word pressure, which, you know, in, in professional and college basketball, winning is paramount. But just get to teach them, to teach them at a, at a young teenage time in their life where those life lessons, you know, it's like giving them a cheat code about <laughs> how you can go about the business of life uh, through, you know, your talent in basketball. So it's been tremendous for me at this stage of my career and my life to be a part of that. You are a podcast and interview professional because that was coach. That was one of the best segues you could have given into my next question, which I wanted to ask you about not just the, the basketball and the skill development. We'll talk about what you want to instill on the court in a second, but I did want to bring it to, you know, you've been a coach obviously involved with basketball development, but really the development um, with, with young men, right. And, and really bringing them along in life. And you just talked about, some of those lessons that you want to instill in players while you're coaching them. So what, what are some of those things that you really want to instill in, in players as you're coaching them now and really make sure that when they leave this overtime elite program, they've taken right. away what as far as being young men? Right. So so there, there are two significant parts to that. One is the athletic part. So these guys come here. We have 31 of them. They're all the best of the best from mm -hmm. wherever region or part of the world they come from. And so getting them used to not being the best of the best, you know, does something to their psyche, you I know, love that. They can lose confidence, they can get upset. Uh, you know, at, at this stage, they can throw the towel. Hey, I can't do this anymore. This is not fair. And you just get an opportunity to teach them. Not only this is how basketball works, but this is how life works. You mm -hmm. know, uh, I, I tell them all the time, you know, we are all just about what grain of sand on the, uh, uh, at the beach. Like nobody really cares exactly who you are, but because of your talent, everybody cares in your own mind. So we got to kind of walk them away from that a little bit. But then, you know, there's this life. And, and so uh, talented athletes, you know, they have three components to what makes them really good, right? Their God-given ability. And the 31 guys here have as much, if not more, God-given ability than anybody else in the country, in the world. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who are good, obviously. But that's not really a separator anymore because there's so mm -hmm. many. Uh, work ethic. Right. So we talk about that. And, and work ethic today has caught up because we have skill development. So if a guy was lazy, he's less apt to be lazy when somebody's knocking on his door, getting them in the gym every single day. And then I, I, I really confuse them. I give them this word wherewithal. Like, tell me the definition of wherewithal. Right. So what does that mean, coach? So we'll look it up. And it has this vast definition. It means that you have the ability to try as best you can to be present through all of the trials and tribulations you have to go through. You can understand coaching. You can understand the dynamics of everything. You can understand surroundings. You, And if you don't, you learn pretty quickly and you adapt and adjust. Because if you talk to any coach or anybody who's you know been through this, this world and has any success, that success a lot of times has come through dealing with failure. And these kids, have, a lot of them have never had real failure. And so having the wherewithal in that, in that word again, to be able to understand it, deal with it, and eventually overcome it is a real learning process for them. And it, it, to me, it's part of the significant separator between those other two entities that a lot of other uh, young guys at this age have, that, that talent, that work ethic. And I think that that's something that I, I would hope the audience would want to hear is that as, as, as their coach, you're constantly challenging these players to, to be more than, than really just what they've come in and been, that they have to be more, that they have to embrace that challenge that adversity although you're doing a great job though coach avoiding failure because your team's 11 and one on the season you guys are off to a terrific start which which we'll talk to uh we'll talk about in a second here but yeah as i said your, your team you're off to an 11 one start which that leaves you at the top of the standings a few games ahead of the dreamers so what really has led to that excellent start to the season and what are the some of the things along with the good what are some of the bad things you think you're still looking to build on as the team progresses throughout the year. Yeah, so, you know, I think every good team, if you if you talk to them, just listen to Kirby Smart at the end of the run for Georgia, and I want to hear what his thoughts are, what makes this team special. You know, uh, uh, Nick Saban, you know, college football giants. I, look, I, I listen to coaches and people talk after the fact all the time because there's always something that's, that's one, unique, but two, very similar mm -hmm. uh, about what they say and what led to that success. So bringing that here, in a different space. This is not high school basketball. This is not college basketball. This is not professional basketball. It's very different, but it has similarities in all three of those areas. So uh, they're at a stage where if I'm looking at a, uh, a college freshman, he's got so much to learn. Well, now I have to back that up a year or two 
and these guys have so much in the game to learn. So, so a lot of my focus is very simplistic. You know, how best can we help you be present, uh, deal with what we were talking about before when, when, you know, the rubber doesn't meet the road, you still got to be understanding of putting your best foot forward, how to play hard, how to play together. And, you know, usually it's easier to do if you can get guys to commit to all those things to play defense uh, than offense. Because on offense, everybody here wants the ball, right? And they try to get success. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, Coach Ali has instituted uh, EGBs, energy generated behaviors. So if we can convince you that those things are really important, then you'll become a much better teammate and you'll have much better chemistry. So we, Last year with, with our team, we struggled a lot to get that point across. We did, and we were successful and try to do it the same. Obviously, we have a high level of talent, you know, guys, so it makes it a little bit easier. And it's worked on the defensive end. And, uh, you know, they've bought into the fact that if we can defend, rebound, and run, we'll, have us, uh, we'll give ourselves an excellent chance to be successful. Um, you know, one of the challenges now, we've moved pieces around, and so we've got to reorganize. We've made trades, and, you know, the things that I've been preaching – the first half of the year, I've got to redo, and it's going to take some time, but we don't have that much time left. So that's a challenge that that I and we got to deal with, but it's it's every day is a fun day, so I, I just take it all with a grain of salt. I love the defense answer, and you, you can tell when, when you're watching the film, right, the, the way that you guys embrace playing defense, it's it's a lot of pro professional type stuff that's going in there, right, the, the way that you in, employ traps and different ball denials and recoveries and switches and all of those different things. You can tell these guys are being played or being taught how to play defense the right way, but damn, Coach, another brilliant segue in, into, where, into where I was going next. I wanted to ask you about the, the trades that have taken place before we get to a man and a sore Thompson. And it wasn't just a, a few players being moved. It was a number of players, but really with your team coach, these are big pieces we're talking about that are now on your team. Like Bryson Tiller, who is somebody who I, we're actually really high on Bryson at the No Stones Collective. We think he has tremendous talent. He could be somebody in the future. Trey Parker is another guard who's coming in who has really, really good talent. Mm -hmm. How as a coach do you embrace those kind of big mid-season moves and really figure out – you know, what What are some of the ways where you're able to incorporate them into what you guys are already doing? Or are there any like minor adjustments that you're making to, to maybe play into some of their strengths? Like, how are you embracing that type of yeah. a big move as a coach? Yeah, it's it's really the first thing that we talked about when we when we first got our group together after the holiday is that, you know, the guys that were left, they, they know the rhythm of how we practice and how we do our business. So we're going to allow you to do that and, and see what happens. Excuse me. Our first few practices. I was pleasantly surprised. Well, they, you know, they get it. They, there is now, it's not going to be pretty all the time. It's not going to be as consistent as I need it to be, but there's an understanding of positioning and communication and all those things that make it work. So uh, out of the gate, it was okay. Uh, but, you know, as time goes on, it becomes a little bit more challenging because you have to learn how to be consistent at it. Yep. You know, and, and consistency is the key to anything that you do. And so we've kind of hit a, a speed bump or two at times uh, on, on our approach to how we have to look at every single day and every single game. And so I, I know that you can't, you know, we've got a lot of young guys. We've got seven new, you know, new people to the program. So they're just figuring it out. And I go back to some of the guys that we had last year that are in really good places this year because of the experience that they've been able to gain. And seven are seven of our guys, however, how no, it doesn't matter how talented they are, are going yep. through that that challenge. So um, it, it keeps me on my toes. You know, <laughs> I've got to be really understanding and patient and caring about where they're at. I don't think anybody does it purposely. Usually, you don't do things because you just don't know and you haven't gotten comfortable of, of you know repetition. And so we we talk about it, we preach it. You know, the other day uh, we played on a back to back on Tuesday, and we had I believe twenty two steals. So that's an unheard of number but it talked to our aggression and you know those those turnovers by the other team lead to touchdowns on our end and so we yep. were successful in that way so there's 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 something there that we can build on but there's also a lot of room for growth and we just got to remain present in what we do and understanding of how we need to go about our business 
how fun is it being able to incorporate a player like like Bryson into what you guys are doing, right? Because like when you when you talk about a men and a source development, which we obviously will, but you really want to develop them in the half court as like pick and roll type ball handlers. And you bring in right. a big like Bryson, he can pick and roll, he can pick and pop, he can be involved right. in the DHOs. Like what how exciting is that for you as a coach to be able to incorporate all these different things with those two guys? Yeah, it's it's really exciting and and not not the least of which is he's a tremendous, tremendous human being. Just that he's he's one of the by virtue of maturity, he's one of the older guys in the building. Right? He just turned 17. You know, his body is, oh, he's got 6'9", he's got wide shoulders, long mm-hmm. arms, huge hands, but he's thirsty. He's thirsty as an athlete. He, he's in the gym all the time. He's thirsty when you talk to him. He's giving you eye contact. He wants to be better. And, you know, that becomes a separator. Uh, we talked about, there. you know, he has this thing, whether he understands it or not, the ability to deal with wherewithal and have it have it work for him. So mm-hmm. it's really a joy to be around him and allows me to pour into him every day. He's got a tremendous family who gets it. You know, they're they're about the long haul. They're not looking for immediate success. Uh, it's about teaching him the right things on court and the value systems he'll need to get through this process. So. You know, I've been I've been blessed to have him. He's young, so he makes a ton of a ton of you know, correctable uh, mistakes sure. on the court. But I, I don't look at it as a negative because, again, I think a, a year from now, it's almost like watching your hair grow. You'll see his game grow. You know, just like somebody who hadn't cut their hair in a year. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, it's just a pleasure to be around him every day. And I think for a lot of the guys here, that's the case where. Uh, you know, the blessing is is mine that I get to be around some of these young guys at this stage of their life and pour into them. And 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 those that are really interested, I mean, really, really interested. He's one of them to to be a sponge in this process. It becomes one of the one of the joys that I've ever had. And, and you know, the many years that I've been in this business. I can speak to that with, with Bryce and I was down at the overtime league facilities for, for some of the preseason action. And Bryce was one of the guys who I got to meet walking around and he was very respectful, very honorable, very mature for, for his age. And I, I know I'm, I'm in a media space and we're doing a podcast right now, coach, but in no ceilings, we, we like to be known as scouts first. And that that's something that, that a scout remembers when you meet somebody yeah. for the first time, how they are, your first impression of them. That's something I'm going to take away with me and I'm going to remember that. So that was definitely great to see on his end but really that's what i've noticed about a a lot of these players and obviously the thompson twins in particular when i got to meet a man personally he was also very respectful very humble but he's one of these guys you know he has that dog in him you know he wants to work you know he wants to be the best and i do want to talk about a man in detail because he's kind of been the quote-unquote mock draft darling if we want to glamour it up in the media space but i've actually been really impressed with what i've seen from a and i think his growth from last year to this year, that's really caught my eye. And it's not just because of the shooting improvements coach and what he's done for his percentages, but his approach to the game, how he processes things, how he kind of takes it play by play. And he just seems on both ends of the floor, he seems very measured in how he handles the game. So what are some of the areas of growth that that have stood out to you with his game? Have you kind of seen some of that stuff as well, not just with the shooting, but how he handles himself on the court? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question and segue into him and in that it, mainly because I had him last year and I see every day. And and for me, you know, he was more uh, he would allow a man to take the forefront in terms of, you know, communication and you know, and stepping up even when something was going wrong. If somebody was picking on those guys, a man would kind of be the, the guy that would, would handle it. Uh, and mainly because I think the man has been touted maybe more than a sorrow over the course of their of their uh their lives uh but he's done a really positive 180 in that department and now he you know with our team he's the one excuse me coach can i say something you know uh or in the middle of a game we need to do this or we need to do that and so his self-awareness and his self-confidence has come so far and and you know both of them are so insatiable about their work and, and i think him coming far is equally as important what he's done in skill development getting better you know so he's he can handle the ball i'm not so sure he's a point guard or a pure point guard but he's gotten better uh at the top of an offense with that but his natural ability to be off the ball and do a lot of different things is really grown uh exponentially and uh so in the in the half court excuse me in the full court you know, it's generational, as I tell people. They, they do things, or he does things that I, in 40 years I've been in gyms, 
with high level players that I that I've never seen. That's like two or three times a week. Uh, but his approach to his work, his approach to the game, his approach to practice has really come a long way. And I think, you know, what the NBA needs more of is is character guys who will do things yeah. every day the right way, especially when they get boatloads of money and all the things that come come with the with the process. Uh, I'm pretty sure that he'll handle it properly uh, as an individual off the court. But I think that's been one of his major advances is that he's really developed emotionally and mentally and, and diving into not just being a student in the game, but but being a leader in the game. No, I, I've been I, I agree with everything that you said. I've been pleasantly surprised with what he's brought to the table because I, I, I know you're a coach and you're not necessarily worried about all the all the big boards and mock drafts and all the stuff that I have to be worried about. But when, when you look at some of these things, you see a sore like four, five, six, seven, however many spots behind a man on some of these boards. And and I and I look and I'm asking myself the question based on what I've seen in his growth this year. Are these people who are making these rankings watching the games this year? And that may sound pretty bold of me to say something like that, but but I'm serious because what Asaurus, in my opinion, has done with his game, the way that he's been shooting the ball, his defensive activity has come up. That's shown by the numbers. He's right. finishing much better overall from the floor. His passing, can you talk about Asaurus' passing ability really quick? Because I know I'm going to hit on that with the men, but I yeah. think Asor has as, as much passing ability and, and vision – as a man with some of the passes he's able to make in the half court and in transition. Yeah. And so, so again, we, when we first got together, um, you know, there's a natural, and I, I don't understand it. No, and I'm not 17 years old. So as a teammate, you really wouldn't understand that the dynamics of being identical twins, right? Essentially yeah. they're the same person, you know, <laughs> they're different names, but they're the same person. So sure. on the court, instinctually, they would give the ball to each other. Well, a lot of times the three other guys are like, hey, hey, what about me? What about me? And they don't understand that, you know, I'm just giving the ball to myself or my most comfortable and trusted confidant. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about it. Guys were getting upset with them and all that kind of thing. They defended themselves. So we, we, we sat down with all of them. And I, I, I sat down with Asar and a man, but it was Asar, again, because he's the one that speaks up more. He's like, coach, we watch film. You know, we watched them together. We watched it with you. We watched it by ourselves. And I, I, you're exactly right. And I guarantee you it will get better. I guarantee you a change. And lo and behold, in two weeks, you know, he, he made a significant change in sharing the basketball. Because I think, you know, there are certain things about these guys' games that, that get overlooked because of the, the generational athletic ability. Yep. And then passing, as you mentioned, is one of them uh, for both of them, but especially Asaw because he's gotten so much better at it. Uh, and especially because he hadn't had the ball in his hands as much as his brother. So I'm pleasantly surprised because the ball is shared more. Uh, and now when we play, defenses are, are adherent to that. You know, they still want to take away their strengths, but they're, they're very willing uh, to, to distribute the ball when, when they have to and when they need to. You know, when you're, when you're a frontline player, you got to decide, you know, when to get 30 and when to take care of your teammates. And it's a growth process because – that's not how they grew up in the game, yep. uh, but they've made tremendous strides, particularly as you mentioned, Asa has made really good strides in that area of sharing and caring with the basketball in his hands. And then you, you mentioned how you've seen Asa really grow in his self-confidence and really grow into what he can be on the court. That That is not a problem with the men. We, we, we can see that on the tape. I can see it up close and personal. He is, he is aggressive. He mm -hmm. wants it on the defensive end. He is a nasty point of attack defender. He gets up in somebody's grill and he wants to take that ball away. That's who he is. Mm -hmm. But on the offensive end, sure, he can attack the basket. He wants to get out in transition. He wants to score at the rim. But his passing approach and his approach to making plays for others, I mean, you, you turn on the film and I can actually call out one pass I saw in person in one of the preseason games where he did – he did like a 360 spin and he flung yeah. that he flung like a pocket pass perfectly yeah. to the big man underneath the basket. Yeah. He just there are just some highlights that he can do, coach, that I you yeah. don't see that from guys sure. his size and with his athletic ability. What what has it been like to coach somebody who can make plays like him? How has that opened things up for for your offense? Yeah. So so what you're talking about is just God given ability. Right. Yeah. So uh to have that kind of quick vision with 
quick twitch reactions to stuff. That's that's it's the highest level of athleticism. It's not because they jump high over the rim. It's mm -hmm. operating in a tight space, a crossover between a leg dribble, you know, getting by their guy in a fraction of a second, and then having the, the vision to see that pass there, uh, and then to make it on time and on target. You know, those things to me um, are, are are not. There's not very many people that can do that. You know, there's very few actually. And, and I've said to people, if, if, if they, you know, the, the Achilles for a man and the SAR both is, Hey, can they make the three? Can they make three? And they've got exponentially better from last year to this year, but if they could, then, you know, uh, 12 all-star appearances and Hall of other, you know, I, 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 I'm singing praises cause it's true. Yep. Uh, and, and their shot will come. So, so with, with a man, you know, that ability at the front of our attack offensive, particularly in the, in the whole court when we're when we're in transition is really really unique you know he can he can make a pass on the right wing uh that nobody sees to all the way opposite end of the court in the in the left hand corner like it was you know a day at the beach and and, and it was like there's not many guys that can do that at any level and there's a there's quite obviously growth because i think in the game of basketball and i think to his advantage you know that true quarterback uh, is not that you know he's been really good in so many areas being a natural quarterback not mm -hmm. of the Paul type not that's not his game but in today's NBA it's it's less about Chris Paul and more about Damian Lillard your ability to score and assist and I wanted to ask you that do you think yeah. that a, that a man can be a, a primary ball handler in the NBA because when you look at like the the teams near the top of the draft like th there are some teams that are going to be in position where they kind of have established guys who can handle the ball and they're sort of the quote unquote primaries for, right. for their teams. But I think for a man to really reach his ceiling, that's the type of player that the scouts would expect him to be. Do you, do you see that in his near NBA future? I, I, no, I look at it a little bit differently in that the okay. NBA, the NBA, you know, how many pure, if we're talking about pure quarterbacks, pure point guards are there on the, on each and every team. There, there are guys that lead the way. Jalen Brunson is a pure quarterback, right? <laughs> but who can really score? Uh, we talked about with Chris Paul, who's getting a little older, but but the game, like I, I watched Miami Heat a lot for obvious reasons. I got one of my guys that play there, and there's three, four, five guys that bring it upside down, yeah, yeah. which is Bam Adebayo, you know. So one, one, I think part of it is saying it's time on the shot clock, and and that and that guard who would have to initiate the offense and then get it back to make a play, pick and roll. Otherwise, you saved yourself a half a dozen seconds out of the 24 to get into your offense and get what you want. So I think there's a lot of that going on uh, where, where that guy who can handle it, uh, he's allowed to handle it, but then there are times he doesn't have to do that. And if he could just be available all the time to operate in space and make quality decisions, yep. wherever he catches the ball, that becomes maybe as important, if not more important than this traditional point guard that's got to have four guys, you know, in front of them and make them all better. There's there's a leadership part to that that's undeniable. Mm -hmm. But the actual basketball structure of it, I think, is again, I, I'm not an expert in the NBA, but I think it's a little bit more uh, uh, it's a little bit different, put it that way, than than it used to be in having that and that quarterback. It is. There's there's a lot more, you know, secondary action, second side actions to, to bring somebody around to get the ball in their hands and then have them make a play while they're on the move. And a men can can certainly do that. You you touched on the jump shooting. You you obviously want to see improvements, but the, the last question I'll ask before I ask a more generalized broad question about them to really close out the show is with a men and his playmaking ability, no, the threat of the jump shot might not always be there, but his first step, I mean, we're talking about elite of the elite, right? The threat of that first step, yeah. is that as dangerous or possibly even more dangerous than just the threat of being able to pull up and hit a jump shot in his case? I, 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 yeah, I believe so. I, I really do. You know, it's again, uh, I, I say it half jokingly, but it's true. And that those kind of things happen two to three, four times a week. And those some of those things for their size, uh, I, I haven't seen. You know, there's, there's mm -hmm. guys at 5'8", 5'9", 5'10", that may be not as quick that first step and that ability to go left to right or right to left. So as I sag off of you, uh, daring you to shoot, if I come at you full speed and, and that first step and then I change directions, I should be able to hopefully get where I want. Now, yeah. you know, the, some of the challenges will come when they don't have the ball in their hands and their man is in really, really uh, good health position. 
And that guy has to trust that if I swing it to them and that guy's got to close out, that they can do those same kinds of things. But I think, you know, the bas basketball is about expertise and they're great at taking away weaknesses of players. And so that's something that over time, that's why you're going there is to, is yep. to be a student of the game and learn and grow. And I think, you know, whatever, whatever is needed, they'll try more than anybody I've ever met to do. And so a man uh, will use that first step to his advantage, particularly in transition offense mm -hmm. uh, and in the half court, you know, it'll start out to be a little bit of a challenge, but I think he'll adjust, you know, quite comfortably. I think having him, um, in, involved in some backdoor type actions, like the way we've seen Jalen Green with the Houston Rockets, right? His ability to just cut beeline along that baseline. He just gets yeah. that easy slam. We've seen that from Shane Sharp. I think yeah. that's one of the easy ways to get them involved in the half court. But the, the last broad question I'll ask, and, and I'm sure I, you, you've already said some of it a little bit. I'm sure I can guess the answer to your question, but well, just how high are the upsides uh, of both the, the Thompson twins? Because we... There's obviously there's there's Victor Wembanyama and Scoot Henderson near the top of the draft, and then you have all the guys who are playing at college and are on national TV, and everybody wants to move those guys up the boards because they're seeing them more frequently. But to make sure that we don't forget about how special these guys can be, because I'd probably be in agreement with what you're about to say, just how high are the upsides of these two guys? Yeah, so you know, again, I think the NBA craves shooting, and that's the one thing that you can target is something that 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 they don't do as well. I would challenge anybody shooting notwithstanding to, to, to target something that they wouldn't be really good at. And I'm talking everything. They are the highest level people that you can be around. They have the highest level of humility. Uh, they, they, they don't even have their licenses yet. They walk around, they get paid a lot of money. You would never know it. They wear sweats that are five years old. Uh, they, they wear old t-shirts. They don't have jewelry. They don't have, they're not consumed by, every, you know, what youth today is consumed with. Uh, they, they are insatiable learners. They work out here four times a day. They're insatiable about their work and very meticulous. Uh, they, they have an understanding that they don't know what they don't know. So they become sponges when it comes to basketball, they have, you know, something past the elite level athleticism. Uh, they play hard. They have desire, a work ethic, all those things. And so when you when you have to check a box, there's, yeah. there's really one box uh, that I can see that you would check. Now, that box happens to be very important in today's NBA basketball. Sure. So so that has to be figured out and managed over time. But everything else, and, and I'm talking to the scout when we were in North Carolina, and, and, and part of the challenge in the NBA is you have all of these young guys that you've drafted high and you've given – you know, the keys to the castle too. And so they make choices about how hard they want to play, how much they want to prepare, uh, you know, the life that they live off the court, how invested are they are that versus invested in the game. And, you know, time will measure that out. I'm not saying that they're going to be perfect at it, but I'm going to put my money on them in those spaces than I would almost anybody else. And, and I will say that because I don't know the other guys in the draft and who they are and what they are. So I'm not doing that sure. kind of comparison. I'm just promoting these guys as unique. You know, they were born under a star. And I only said that before about Ray Allen. <laughs> they, 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 they were born under a star. That's that's high praise because Ray Allen was one hell of a player <laughs> in his own right, right? So that's that's incredibly high praise from Coach Leto. Before, before we close out, a anything else that you'd want to say about the, the Overtime Elite program, about any of the guys you're coaching, the lessons, anything else you want to get off your chest? Yeah, no, I think, you know, again, for me and all the places and spaces that I've coached in over over the years, uh, this has been the joy of a lifetime. One, because Kevin Ali is maybe the best human being uh, uh, that I that I could ever be around. You know, his spirit is is unique. It's insatiable. The culture that's been created here by him uh, is the way you want to be able to teach and, and have young people live their lives. And he's a prime example of that. He's been to the top of the mountain. He's mm -hmm. been at the depths of, of, of hell uh, and, and, and been humble in both of those situations. And so he's a great example. And it allows me to come into this building every day and just be a teacher, you know, whatever and whoever. It's not just the 31 players we have. It's the people in the building yep. as, as the elder statesman that, hey, if you need some advice, you need some time, all that. And so I, I think this, this overtime elite building and company and all that, has a unique opportunity to create a space 
in the basketball world that can be extremely successful, you know, and I, it's not easy. All, most new businesses fail before they succeed. And so I'm not sure I understand or know or want to know all the challenges when it comes to the financial end of it and how you keep, you know, being very aggressive about making money. But from a basketball perspective, um, it's, it's really, really unique. And I'm having the time of my life. No, I, it, it's certainly, it's certainly been an excellent opportunity um, to, to be able to watch the program grow just from year one to year two, the quality of basketball, the quality of talent, the guys coming in, it's, it's certainly grown pretty quickly. In my opinion, I think it's only going to continue to trend upwards. So everyone out there, make sure that you are watching the overtime elite league. They're available on Amazon prime. Um, there, there are some games that you can still find on YouTube as well, but certainly make sure that you are watching these guys. Cause what the overtime elite program is doing and what they're becoming, that this is a hotbed for, for NBA level talent. So definitely make sure you're tuned in, but thank you so much coach for taking some time, volunteering some of your day to talk with us here at no ceilings. I, this, this interview was everything I could have wanted it to be. So I, yeah. I truly mean that. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Pleasure's all mine. And if you ever need a partner, let me know. I got some free time. <laughs> <laughs> you you know I'll have you back, Coach. Whenever you want to come back, you, you know I'll have you back. But thank you out there for everyone who's been listening to this episode of Home and Away on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. You can subscribe to the No Ceilings NBA podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Make sure you comment, like, rate, review, all that fun stuff. And make sure you're also subscribed to NoCeilingsNBA.com our Substack newsletter. We are pumping out content Monday through Friday on nothing but the NBA draft. We are your experts when it comes to the NBA draft. And you can follow me on Twitter at Draft Deeper as well as the collective at No Ceilings NBA. So until we meet again on this feed, thank you so much again for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.